You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a collected work of Rudolf Steiner, entitled, or numbered 314, entitled Physiology and Healing, Treatment, Therapy, and Hygiene, translated by Anna Moise, 13 lectures, an address, two discussions, and a question and answer session held in Dornach and Stuttgart between March 1920 and April 1924. And this is the first part, entitled Physiology and Therapy Based on the Science of the Spirit, Lecture 1, given in Dornach on the 7th of October, 1920. The speaker has not yet arrived. I hope he'll be here soon. But for now, I don't wish to have you sitting there waiting. It is self-evident that this series of lectures carries particular weight as part of the course. The intention is to take a practical subject and show how our spiritual science, with anthroposophical orientation, truly can play an effective role in everyday life. Now, as everyone knows from personal experience, medicine, medical treatment, is a most important sphere of life. And for this reason, if no other, we must not fail to take anthroposophy into the field of medicine right from the beginning of our anthroposophical endeavors. In this course, we endeavored to have the individual subject areas covered by people who are qualified specialists, also in everyday terms. It is necessary to do so when we, representing spiritual science, present the different subjects to the world, for otherwise they are not taken the way they are meant to be taken. I will therefore try and say a few things about physiology and how it relates to medical treatment until the speaker arrives, doing so from the spiritual scientific point of view. That was more or less the proposed subject matter. And I want to show you how much spiritual science is needed in the study of medicine and then also in medical practice, in the whole art of medicine. As you know, at our universities, the study of medicine is usually preceded by a study of the sciences. The actual study of medicine comes after this. Having got to know the phenomena more of biology and physiology, one then gives consideration to the pathological phenomena until one finally comes to the subject of therapeutics. Many members of this audience will no doubt know that therapy really gets a poor deal in the process. It is indeed true that with the study of medicine, given this scientific approach, people concentrate on the natural processes relating to human beings. When the future physicians then come to the subject of pathological processes, they do so with a mind concentrated on natural processes and are hardly able to see pathological processes in the right light. Now there is an opinion which I think has come up more or less of necessity in more recent times. We tend to gain a particular view of processes in nature, their inner connection and the underlying causes. In a healthy individual we must therefore, under these conditions, quite evidently look for certain natural processes in a necessary causal relationship. In a sick person, or let us say in a sick organism, what can we look for but basically also natural processes subject to causal necessity? Yet we are compelled to say that compared to a healthy organism, the natural processes in their very obviously causal development of a disease are abnormal in a way dropping out of the system of causal relationship that exists in a healthy organism. In short, as soon as we enter into the field of medicine, doubt and skepticism arise 
concerning our actual approach to the study of nature when it comes to considering natural events from the modern point of view. Many medical people, therefore, develop a real skepticism, downright nihilism, as I have said here on other occasions, when it comes to treatment. I have known famous professors at the Faculty of Medicine in Vienna, at a time when that Faculty of Medicine was at the height of its glory, who, at heart, really were nihilists when it came to treatment. They said that one can really only let a disease take its course, and they took the particular disease where such a view does certainly apply, pneumonia, as an example. One can guide the course it is taken, taking with external measures that will ameliorate or promote it until the crisis comes and the whole then dies down again. Essentially, we cannot speak of a cure in the true sense of the word, though people have done so for centuries, if not millennia. If such a view were to be consistently taken further, medicine would gradually develop into pure pathology. For in the study of diseases, albeit from the point of view of a natural science based on materialistic thinking, an extraordinary degree of perfection has been achieved in this age of therapeutic nihilism. At this point I'd also warn you against the potential misconception that in Dornach and in spiritual science with anthroposophical orientation we fail to recognize and tend to underestimate the full significance of modern science. That is not at all the case. Someone who has taken even just a brief look at the methods of investigation in pathology in the second half of the 19th century and how they have developed can only do so in amazement and admiration for the brilliant, tremendous progress made. Yet beyond this, he must also make a very different admission. He has to say to himself, yes, materialism has arrived, but it cannot meet certain needs in the human heart and mind, nor can it cast an adequate light on vast areas of human insight. Materialism has, however, had its own kind of mission, I'd say. It has made us develop our ability to experiment and observe in an extraordinarily careful and thorough way. We are entirely indebted to this materialism for our modern pathology, even if it does have that materialistic bias. People will always complain if one is not biased in our present age. As editor of the journal titled Magazine for Literatur, I was labeled a materialist when I had written an article about Buechner's death that excuse me, Buechner's death that did not condemn him but did indeed express appreciation of his merits. This is what matters when we live with and practice the science of the spirit, that we are able to enter into everything everywhere, finding the thought form, the form of sentience, on which approaches and philosophies that may be complete opposites may draw. And we are also able to appreciate the merits of something which has its root in such a thing as materialism. At the present time, and this is simply the need of our time, we must, however, overcome materialism. There is something else to which I'd like to draw your attention. You will have heard in the lectures given here that we seek to establish a phenomenology in science. You will also have heard, with full justification, that there is need to look for a chemistry free from hypothesis. I am keen to discover if someone might not find that with regard to one thing or another, which indeed has to be presented with reference to medicine and the practice of medicine. The discussions do not also cover elements that will seem to him to be hypothetical. But we must first clearly establish the concept hypothesis, especially when moving from the study of the inorganic to the organic. What is an hypothesis? Well, let us take a perfectly ordinary thing from everyday life. When I have walked along a road and seen someone along this road and walked on 
and then did not see him any more, I am unlikely to assume at first that this person has disappeared into the ground, something most unlikely to happen. No, I'll look around and perhaps see a house. I can limit my ideas and say to myself, well, he's gone into that house. I don't see him now, but he's in there. It would be a justifiable hypothesis if I were to take the thoughts, as it were, that come to me as my senses perceive this. And then something occurs that needs further explanation. So that I have to presuppose something, take it as a hypothesis. This will arise from my train of thought, but cannot be seen or observed directly, so that it is not a direct phenomenon for me. I would not be setting up a vague hypothesis in making such an assumption, just as I'd not be setting up a vague hypothesis when, on using a thermometer, I first perceive an increase in temperature and then see this temperature disappear due to freezing or something of the kind, and speak of the loss of latent heat. If investigation is to be fruitful, it is now and then necessary, therefore, to take the sequence of sensory concepts further. An unjustifiable hypothesis is one where we arrive at ideas where we take them further and consider them with insight it becomes evident that the things on which it is based simply cannot ever be perceived. We must then provide the ideas we arrive at, ideas on atomism, molecularism, with ingredients that can never be perceived, otherwise we would be able to perceive them. For we could never, for instance, cherish the illusion, if there were some kind of process by which it would be possible to see even the smallest particle of bodies, that we could then still explain light as arising from motion. In that case, we would actually be taking light into those smallest particles. I would ask you to make occasion at this point to develop a clear idea of justifiably continuing in thought within an experience on the one hand and of establishing unjustifiable hypotheses on the other. To come back once more to that earlier thought, we have to say, we see someone before us whom we consider to be normal, in quotes, and we see someone else who has fallen ill. We must of necessity acknowledge a process taking its natural course in either case. Yet how does the one process relate to the other? The fact that we keep physiology, pathology, and medical treatment separate as has become the custom in recent times, prevents us from gaining the relevant ideas as we move from one to the other. Apart from this, modern medical people really cannot include the spiritual in their considerations when working with physiology or also pathology, for the spiritual is really something unknown in the modern approach to science and so it is not included in any of their considerations. It is possible to contrast the two natural processes, one physiological, the other pathological, definitely and clearly, initially in abstract form, choosing certain final forms in pathology, I'd say, and the study of such final forms may perhaps allow us to arrive at fruitful ideas. You need not think of there being an absolute necessity of it being demanded when you are at the beginning of a science. This correctness, something we call inner necessity, can only develop in the course of our studies. And we may therefore start at any point, I'd say, if we want to study a particular thing in nature. Let us take a truly extreme case within the sick human organism. One most extreme case which presents many problems in modern medicine is the development of cancer. With this we see, as may also be seen under the microscope, something organic, or at least looking organic, developing in such a way in the ordinary organism that it will gradually destroy life in the rest of that organism. 
At first all we can say is that within the body of the human organism we see something arise where we see how, rising from unknown depths, something enters into the usual natural course which interferes with the development of that natural course. We may also turn to the other extreme of a pathological organism. We can perceive something arising, something where, in a sense, normal activity in the human organism proliferates, becoming unnormal. We then consider the human organism to be abnormal. I don't particularly wish to operate with the terms normal and abnormal, but they will serve our purpose for the moment. In due course of time, it would then be evident, if this line of thought were to be taken further, which I hope it won't, that in transition the normal would also simply go over into the abnormal, as it is called. Just for the moment it would be reasonable to use the terms normal and abnormal. With reference to the normal human organization, we note that in the psyche too, a specific form of will, intent, develops, a specific form of feeling, and a specific form of thinking. In social life, we have gradually let a kind of normal image crystallize out of the ideas we gain from dealing with other people, an image which makes us consider a person as normal, who, to a certain degree, develops his will, feeling, and thinking out of his own nature. Concentrating that thought just a little, we will inevitably say to ourselves that if the organism functions too strongly, functioning like a body containing latent heat from which we remove that latent heat and which could then release too much free heat into the surrounding world so that we'd no longer know what to do with this heat. Now, if the human organism were to function in such a way, sending out too much in this direction, it would of necessity, if it were to present itself to us in reality, have to show the results which we've arrived at in our thinking though the emotional element always comes into this through the element of feeling. In our thoughts, such a human organism would seem to us to be affected by the abnormality we call mania. We see something appear in this human organism which results from powers of organization flooding it, powers that go very much in the direction of sensory qualities. Carcinoma-type developments are something where natural force appears in the organism, segregating itself, as it were, where this organizing power becomes embedded in the organism. On the other hand, the pathological phenomena of mania, or the like, are something which the organism is not able to hold on to, as it were, something which comes out of the organism. If I were to draw a diagram of this, I would do it by saying, if this normal development of the human organism, I draw in the occurrence of a carcinomatous growth like this, there's a figure, putting something by way of powers of growth in some place or other, powers that now cling to the organism inwardly, so that it must there provide something which otherwise it would provide for the whole organism. For a diagram of mania, I would have to show something welling forth from the organism, something pushing toward the sphere of mind and soul. I have been referring to extreme situations, and you may consider them also in less acute forms. Imagine the problem does not go as far as developing into a carcinoma, but rather a carcinomatous change prevented from going all the way in that case, some organ or other, for these things do not happen in a vacuum, of course, nor in spaces between organs, is taken hold of. But the power, which otherwise tends to go inward and in there emancipate, growing quite independent, unites with the power normal to the organ. The organ is then affected by a disease, which we may refer to in many different ways, as has come to be the custom in medicine. Let us assume a tendency toward mania is stopped halfway. The abnormality of the individual's organization, 
does not cause the element of mind and soul to be put outside completely, as is the case with full-blown mania, where it is completely beside itself, as it were, and the thought element emotionally goes its own way. The element which tends toward the other extreme goes only halfway, and we then have the different forms of mental illness, as it is called as it is called, I say, which may take all kinds of different forms, from illusions, which are organic in origin, all the way to states of hysteria and so on, where an organic origin is hardly demonstrable, though they do have their basis in the organism. As you can see, the aim has been to consider the phenomena that take us from the normal to the pathological in two different directions. We must consider these phenomena before we can form an opinion about them. Let me now show you from another angle how it is possible to grasp, at least to a degree, what is behind it all, doing so not yet entirely out of the science of the spirit, the methods of which I have referred to as insight in images, inspiration, and intuition, but by using a certain instinct, as we might call it, though unless there is a desire to progress to the spiritual scientific way, doing it from instinct will only take us halfway. There is an extraordinarily interesting phenomenon in the evolution of German culture. Leaving aside one's personal view of Schelling as a philosopher, he is an interesting phenomenon in the history of civilization. Perhaps everything he has developed as a philosophy may be wrong, and askew. But there was a certain instinct alive in him for natural processes, even in areas where people working in ordinary science are not at ease in following events in nature, relying more on a very crude empiricism. Schelling has indeed also tried to think in terms of medicine, as occasion arose and actually devoted quite some time, especially to issues relating to healing processes. Little thought has been given in the more recent study of the history of philosophy to how Schelling actually came to leave more abstract and local philosophical deliberations aside and enter quite instinctively into a realistic study of nature and even the organic sphere he actually published a journal in which medical issues were extensively considered. Where did this come from? We can come to understand it if we know and learn to appreciate in the right way the profound instincts for gaining insight on which Schelling drew for his truths and his errors. And so we find a remarkable statement made by Schelling, not based on clear insight, I'd say, but hewn from the instincts in his psyche. He said that to gain insight into nature was to create nature. Now, if these words were to be realized directly from human insight, we'd find it easy to enter into medicine. If we could have the creative powers entering into our search for insight, if we had powers of creation in our thinking, we would find it quite easy to enter into the field of physiological and pathological phenomena, for we would then be able to observe the steps taken by creative nature, as it were. From the empirical point of view, one simply has to say that we are unable to do so. Someone who then takes this further would be able to say that the very fact that a demand like the one made by Schelling cannot be met going beyond human capacities, is partly the reason why we are not able initially to see into a process of this kind, where new developments arise. Being unable to follow nature's creative work directly, with our powers of insight, we are unable to see into the process where new forms, new developments arise. We are thus not immediately able to look into the facts of material processes, such as the development of a carcinoma. However, if we rightly bring together this thing which is truly denied us, that is, our inability to do with the things which do present themselves to us in the carcinomatous process, when a man of genius demands, when he says that to gain insight into nature is to create nature, 
If we bring this together with the phenomena of the carcinomatous process, it will become evident how one must tackle processes of this kind. We have to admit that Schelling did not speak from instinct in other respects. Just consider how his utterances were polar opposites. On the one hand, we have the words, to gain insight into nature is to create nature, something we are unable to do. On the other hand, there are these words, to gain insight into the spirit is to destroy the spirit. So far, only people involved in spiritual science have said these words, and even then only in a certain mysterious obscurity. To gain insight into the spirit is to destroy the spirit. Now, if we are unable to achieve the creative work of nature, then, initially admitting this merely in analogous form, we may go further into this later, we are also unable, with our human capacities, to destroy the spirit. We cannot penetrate with our powers of insight to the point where the destruction of things spiritual begins. Yet you will have an inkling, I think, that here we have a certain relationship to manic or similar states where something destructive arises in mind and spirit. There is need to look for the connection between the normal human powers that cannot create nature by gaining insight into it and those that cannot destroy the spirit by gaining insight into it. I have thus shown you the way initially, something which takes us from a normal but instinctively more deeply stimulated conscious awareness to the relationship of the human being to nature. We shall see that along this road, which I have now indicated, there lies, as we go on, the element we must really look for as we move on from physiology to pathology. Well, I hope that it won't be necessary for me to speak to you about this tomorrow as well, but I will try to take this line of thought further one evening during the next few days, at least in outline. The end of Lecture 1